This segment focuses on another way to go about synthesizing alcohols, and in this strategy we're going to focus on using organometallic compounds as our tools for creating alcohol products. As we dive into this, the first thing we need to look at is what we're talking about when we refer to an organometallic compound. When we use the term organometallic compound, what we're referring to by definition is a compound that has a carbon atom directly bonded to a metal atom, which I'm abbreviating as M here. Common metals that are used in organic metallic reagents include sodium, lithium, magnesium, and others. Typically these are compounds that are found in the first two columns of the periodic table. When we think about the electronegativity of carbon relative to any of these metals, carbon is going to be the more electronegative atom by a significant margin. And so what's going to happen is if we think about the polarization of the carbon metal bond, the carbon being that it is much more electronegative than the metal that we're using is going to take a very strong negative polarization, whereas the metal will be very highly positively polar. So in other words, what's going to happen here is that those electrons within this bond are going to be in the possession primarily of the carbon atom because the carbon is so much more electronegative it's going to take the lion's share of electrons from that bond. And so really in terms of how these are going to react, we can think of the reaction conceptually in terms of the carbon behaving as a carb anion. In other words, this carbon is going to act as a nucleophile. So we can really think of that carbon metal bond as being so polarized that those electrons that I've highlighted in gray there from the covalent bond are really for our intents and purposes possessed by the carbon, giving that carbon a negative formal charge and allowing that carbon therefore to act as a base or as a nucleophile. And it will act as a base by definition if what it ends up doing is grabbing a proton. It will act as a nucleophile if what it ends up doing is forming a bond to an electrophilic atom such as a carbon. So let's take a look at how we can generate organometallic compounds and how we can use those to allow us to make alcohol products. The synthesis of organometallic compounds is going to rely upon taking elemental metal and mixing it with our carbon-containing compound, um, specifically alkyl halides. To look at how we go out synthesizing organometallic compounds from alkyl halides, what we'll do is take this starting alkyl halide, we'll react it with two moles of lithium metal per one mole of alkyl halide. And what we would observe as the products of the net chemical equation of this is we would replace the chlorine atom from our alkyl halide with a lithium atom and as our other product we would generate lithium chloride salt. So now that we have done that what we would observe is that this final product or organometallic compound would have that ability to act as a carb anion. So we can think of that carbon there that's bonded to the lithium as behaving really as a carb anion and lithium as behaving like a, car a cation because it has lost essentially all of its electron density due to the fact that that bond connecting the lithium and carbon is so so strongly positively polarized. You may be asking yourself can we do this reaction only at sp3 carbons which is the type of carbon that we would have here or could we also do this reaction at sp2 carbons or sp carbons? It's a super versatile, versatile reaction. So we can in fact do this reaction at sp2 carbons or sp carbons as well. So for example, we could take our two group one metal, such as lithium, react it with chlorobenzene, this molecule shown here, which has, you'll notice, an sp2 carbon atom bonded to our chlorine. And what's going to happen is that essentially the lithium replaces the chlorine in there to give us our aromatic ring directly bonded to lithium. And then lithium chloride is the other product of this balanced chemical equation, which we don't frankly care about all that much, to be honest. So then in this case, since we have a bond between the sp2 carbon and lithium, what would happen 
is that due to the fact that that bond is very, very, very much polarized here, with the carbon taking the lion's share of the electrons, we could think of that carbon as behaving like a carb anion, having all the electron density from that bond associated with it, and having a negative formal charge there to, to allow that sp2 carbon to act as a nucleophile in subsequent reactions. We can also do this type of reaction very commonly with magnesium. And the inventor of the reaction that involves taking magnesium metal and using it to create an organometallic compound as a nucleophile was a person called Grignard. And that's spelled a little bit different than it's pronounced. So it's pronounced Grignard, but it's spelled Grignard. So just to make things a little extra tricky for you, this is our Grignard reagent. Our Grignard reagent is going to feature a carbon bonded to magnesium, and then that magnesium is also going to have a halogen over here bonded to that. So X is equal to a halogen atom here. These are going to behave very similarly to the organolithium compounds that we were talking about up top and all of the other organometallic compounds. And in looking at how we go about synthesizing these molecules with magnesium from column two of the periodic table forming a bond to carbon, it's gonna be very similar to how we synthesize the other organometallics and that we're gonna take an alkyl halide starting material and react it with magnesium metal. So let's take a look at that reaction. In the balanced chemical equation for this reaction, we just need a one-to-one -one ratio of magnesium to our molecule as a carbon halogen bond. And you'll notice here that we're using an sp2 carbon. That's totally fine. These reactions are super duper versatile, so it doesn't really matter what type of carbon atom has that bromine bonded to it. And what's going to happen here in this reaction is that you get a bond then between carbon and magnesium, and then the bromine's still gonna be hanging out here to the side as well. But the, the main point of showing this is that the carbon atom right here is going to be very, very negatively polarized to the point that we can think of that as behaving as a carb anion. So really what we would generate out of this is our carbon nucleophile right there to use for further reactions. So that's gonna be how we go about making this so-called Grignard reagent. The definition of a Grignard reagent is that we have to have that carbon magnesium bond. Otherwise, if it's something else, it's just gonna be the typical organometallic reagent. When we're thinking about making these Grignard reagents, one important consideration for both Grignard reagents and for other organometallics, such as the organolithium, is that the solvent that's used in these reactions must be aprotic. And the word aprotic means without protons, meaning it is unable to donate protons, meaning that it is unable to act as an acid. And this is important because if we were to use something like water as the solvent here, the product of this reaction is a very strong base due to the fact that it has a negatively charged carbon. Negatively charged carbons are inherently very unstable and therefore very eager to react with whatever they can come in contact with. And so if you had a solvent there, such as water or methanol or something that could readily donate a proton, then what will happen is that your carb anion will act as a base to deprotonate the water or whatever protic solvent you were using here. So for example, in the case of the scenario we don't want using a protic solvent, so if we were to use a protic solvent of water, or even in this case, if we were to conduct this experiment in an environment that was really rich in water, what would happen is that our nucleophile that we had generated as a result of that reaction of magnesium and our alkyl halide is that that carbon acts as either a base or a nucleophile. And so if the first thing it runs into is water. Water, remember, can act as either an acid or a base, whatever is needed for the situation. And so in reacting with a really basic carbon nucleophile, really unstable anion, that unstable anion would come over, grab a proton from here, break the oxygen-hydrogen bond, and then you would be left with just an alkene as your product right here, as well as OH- in this acid-base reaction, which is probably not what you want to do. So instead, you have to place the reaction, carry out the reaction, in an aprotic solvent so that you will get the desired 
formation of a carb anion that is relatively stable so that you can then mix it with the intended target, the electrophile, to do what you need to do. So the aprotic solvents that we can use for this are going to be things like alkane solvents such as hexane is a common solvent, it's a liquid that you can mix these reagents together in. Another extremely common solvent for this are going to be ether molecules. So for example, diethyl ether, CH3, CH2, O, CH2, CH3, all of the hydrogens in here are bonded to carbon atoms, so none of those are very easily removed, and hence this is a very non-acidic solvent, or so-called aprotic solvent. And so in the aprotic solvent, what will happen is that the carbon nucleophile, the carb anion, will remain unchanged, it will remain intact. That is, until you bring in the electrophile for it to react with. So it's for this reason that when you're thinking about doing the synthesis of organometallic reagents, you have to absolutely do this under meticulous conditions that control the water in the environment because you definitely want to keep all the water out by conducting this in sealed containers that have had the water rigorously removed from them. Otherwise, what you will end up with is a bunch of side product that corresponds to your carb anion acting as a base to grab a proton from water acting as the acid. So instead you do this in an aprotic solvent using things like hexane or ether or other things that have carbon hydrogen bonds exclusively with no hydrogens that are bonded to heteroatoms so that the carb anion remains intact because your protic solvents are gonna be things that have hydrogen bonded to heteroatoms. And remembering that heteroatoms are atoms that are non-carbon, non-hydrogen atoms, so oxygen, sulfur, things like that. Now that we've talked about how to generate organometallic compounds by reacting alkyl halides with magnesium or with other metals, what we're going to do is move on to the next segment, part two of this, where we're going to use these organometallic reagents to end up creating alcohols as our final targeted products.